I want to thank William to give me this opportunity because actually uh, becoming a professor and giving lectures on structural mechanics place theories is one of my long-term dreams, I have to say. So today is like a dream come true. And uh, yeah, first of all, I want to uh, introduce, briefly introduce myself. My name is Junior Zhu and currently I'm a postdoc at both Mackey and Kami. And basically I'm working on three types of research. The first one is I'm now doing electrochemical mechanics of energy storage systems, basically lithium ion batteries. And second thing is I'm doing data-driven modeling of different kinds of complex systems that includes lithium ion batteries and also next generation solid state batteries. Okay, and the last one I think it's very related to this class. It's the mechanics and controversies of thin world structures. That includes some uh, automotive industry uh, applications and also shipbuilding industries. So um, here I also provided my email address and also my homepage. If you are interested in like today's uh, lecture or you are interested in my research, please, please just let me know and uh, just send me an email. Probably we can uh, grab a coffee and discuss once they're mighty reopens, right? And okay, so today's lecture, I will talk about uh, advanced topics on plate buckling. So I was actually actively following your lectures previously. So I found that you already covered a lot of plate buckling theories in lecture 10 and 11. So today, I, I think it's a good opportunity to talk about some, uh, I said it's advanced topics. So, uh, yeah, I will start from here. So this is about today's lecture. So the first take home message is, yeah, it's very important. It will not be covered by your question. I think we have already explained, right? So uh, uh, then actually, this is also the reason that then I can be more flexible and to give you as much uh, examples as I can. And second here is I uh, put today's outline here. Today, basically I will cover three topics, three uh, there are three tasks for me. The first one is I will drive, redrive the four proof of common equation using an energy method. So basically I know that you have already done it uh, within, with another method and today I'm doing it uh, in uh, energy method. And the second is I will uh, give you an example. In this example, uh, I mean the example is in our everyday life, it's about wrinkling. So in this example, I will try to let you show you how to like simplify this equation to make it solvable. And also I want to show you how the smart people in our area, like those experts who are, how, to, how they are simplifying the equations and how they are solving the equations to model the wrinkles. And the last one is I want to give you uh, more examples in engineering. And uh, uh, this engineering branches, uh, there are a lot of branches, uh, something like uh, building automotive, in the other areas. So, uh, yeah, I actually graduated, graduated uh, just last year from Mackey. So when I was a student, I always prefer those class that is taught by handwriting notes, right? However, now this is my turn to give a lecture and I find it really challenging because this is, one reason is this is the last lecture, right? So if I want to cover some advanced topics, there are a lot of equations. Now I'll let you know that there is one equation I practiced, if I write it from the beginning to the end, it may take me like two minutes. So I don't want to spend too much time to, on writing. So uh, and another reason is uh, because it's the last lecture. So both William and I want to give you uh, as much, as many examples as we can, like in your future research or in your future engineering experience, probably those kind of examples can inspire you. So this is our purpose. Basically, uh, however, I'm now using like PowerPoint, but I don't want to be too fast. So I'm also using uh, a handwriting uh, pad. So basically the first two parts, I will do PowerPoint plus some handwriting notes. Okay, I will do it in this way. And uh, the last part, I will basically use PowerPoint and which includes some images, photos, and also some video. Sorry, videos. So this is today's outline. Okay, I will start from the first task, which is uh, uh, the redriving of the uh, FVK equation. From now on, I will use FVK equation uh, to use this name, okay? So uh, as I said, we can recall from lecture 10 that 
we already derived this FVK equations from the uh, using energy uh, using the method of adjacent uh, equilibrium, right? At that time, we list like every force, like a force balance and momentum balance, like this. And later in lecture ten, uh, lecture eleven, we learned how to use energy method, right, to do stability analysis. So basically, today I will combine these two to show you how to do uh, uh, energy method to to derive this this very important question, uh, e equation, which is the governing equation, right? Governing equation equation for this plate buckling. Okay, so let's start. Uh, first of all, I think I have to well define what is the plate that we will uh, we will study. Right? This is uh, for, first of all, this is an elastic plate. So I put the elastic plate here, and the geometry is here. So the length is L, and the width is W. Here I always write this way to show you this is capital, and I put the origin origin here at the uh, left corner, left corner of, of the of the plate. And I put x, y, z, x, y, z is my coordinate. And I use u, v, w as the displacement vector. OK, so this will display uh, displays the displace, displacement. But the other things are related to it. We have Epsilon alpha beta. So where alpha beta equals x y are the in plane or membrane strain. And in the membrane, we also need to define n, right? This is the membrane force. Other things are curvature, right? The curvature. And its conjugation in terms of energy is the moment. So basically, I think this notation is also the same as you are using in your previous lectures. So in this plate here, it's x equals 0, x equals L, y 0, y w. So this is how this that we will study. Okay. With this definition, I think it's now quite okay for us to go into the total strain energy, right? First of all, I think uh, it's as you state the, the assumptions that we've made, like we assume that there is an additive decom decomposition of the total stored energy. So basically, there are two parts. Here, I use uh, not the energy, the energy density. So that means something you, we put a bar there, that means the energy density. So the energy density can be two parts. The first one is the membrane strain energy density. So if you can recall, it, read, it can be written in this way. Epsilon xx squared plus yy squared plus 2 mu epsilon xx epsilon yy plus 2. Right, this way. xy squared. Right. So here you see is the stretch. Stretching thickness. So, stretching thickness, if you can recall, it's basically something like this. E is the other modulus, and mu is the uh, percent ratio, right? And the other part is the bending the, uh, energy density. It's quite similar if you write in this way. It's nothing but you replace the strain with the curvature, right? So I will repeat this guy. U, U, Y, U square, X, Y square. Right? And D here equals E, H cubic over 12, then S U square. E is a bending. So in this way, we will define the two energy densities. So the total energy will be the integral of the energy density. And here, I put a bar here. So if we can, uh, also we can write it in the other way, like uh, double integral and uh, 
we put NAB density plus membrane dx dy okay, in this way. So this way gives uh, this slide gives you the definitions of all the total uh, energy and density and total energy, right? So then we can recall from lecture 10, I think, uh, we talked about the condition of equilibrium. So at that time, we gave you such a, a criterion. So this is, that means uh, uh, this is, this guy is uh, variation, right? Variation of the total energy is zero. So we, because we have already have that decomposition, so it's quite safe for us to do some transformation. dx, dy, zero. Basically, that means uh, the, the operation of variation can go into the integrals, and you can do separately on uh, membrane energy density and also bending energy density. So uh, it's quite uh, a lot of mass which you will be following this equation. However, I'm always trying to give you, I will be always trying to give you the physical meaning of these equations. So first, I want to, to let you know is of course, delta I mentioned, this is variation, right? How to understand variation? Actually, this is a mathematic term. However, we can understand it as a small change of something, physically, of something. So this criterion tells us nothing but uh, in equilibrium. A small change in a plate, I mean, a small change of your total energy should be zero, right? If it is in uh, equilibrium. Yeah, so this is what uh, the physics behind this criterion. It's still a little bit confusing to us. So what is a small change of total energy, right? What causes this? What, cause, what can cause this small change. So it's still a little bit hard to understand that. So however, I think mathematically it's quite clear. Mathematically, it's quite clear because we know now that the total energy is from this equation and that equation and recall that we already derived the equations for this guy and this guy, right? Is a function. of several functions, right? Several functions. So what are those functions? As I mentioned, there can be uh, um, ub, like this. However, if we look more into these two uh, expressions, we find there is some strain, right? Strain, and it's conjugate uh, membrane uh, force, right? And also, in these functions, we have kappa, the curvature, and its conjugate moment, right? So total energy is a function of, of several functions of this size. So literally, it's quite complicated. However, in mass, in mass, there is a term called functional. Functional means a function of several functions or one function. So actually, mass, the, some mathematic theories already provided with uh, provided us a, a quite mature. I mean, I think it's a quite mature tool to study the equilibrium equilibrium of such kind of functional. There is actually a special term called uh, there is a special uh, field called. Uh, calculus, calculus of variations. So if you are interested in this kind of math, you can turn to this subject and uh, read some books. And what I mean here, the equilibrium equation can be found by just calculating the so-called Euler like range equation of uh, functional. So this is a quite mature tool. That's a lot of math, but I, I mean, I don't want to cover all these step-by-step -step, uh, derivations for you. 
whenever if you have like a like a total energy functional, you can get its regular back uh, Lagrange equation, and definitely you can get that one. And I did it for you in lecture notes. I think just one give you, give you give you my lecture notes uh, for twenty two, and there is a step by step step derivation. So if you are interested in the uh, derivation, please go to the lecture notes. I think it's quite uh, clear because there it just involves some mathematic uh, tricks. Okay, but today I I want to give you some physics understanding of it. So I will only cover what is the physics behind this kind of variation and the derivations. So first of all, I think uh, I said that this uh, the criterion is about a small change of energy, right? The total energy. However, I want to let you know that energy is quite comp complex because whenever you have a system, it's really hard to say how much energy is in the system, right? Or a plate. So Whenever we we get such a plate, actually, what is more straightforward for us to consider is we only want to study a small change of what of displacement and rotation, right? So this is something uh, much uh, probably much simple, and I have to say it's much straightforward forward for us, and more importantly, it's usually measurable for us. So it's always uh, easier for us to describe a system in this way. So what in, in our system, what is the displacement or small change of displacement? It involves delta u, right? A small change of u, a small change of v, a small change of w. Also the rotations are small change w uh, comma x, w comma y. Here, Probably I'm not sure if you cover it. I introduced a new notation of comma. So comma something means just take partial difference to a derivative of something. So like uh, x the comma uh, w or comma x is something is just dw dx. So this is the definition of the. I mean this is a new uh, probably a new notation. So whenever we have a plate, we don't want to describe it in, in terms of energy. We want to describe it in terms of this kind of displacement and rotations, right? So how to do this? Actually, you can, uh, I mean, you can turn to the, the action notes and find uh, there, there are actually two important steps. However, today I'm just giving you <laughs> this answer. So this equation is the equation set I mentioned that it probably will take, you, take me two minutes in class to write it down. So now I just give you the answer. So now here, this is uh, on the left side is uh, a small change of total energy and on the right side of it is my uh, i want to use different color oh sorry different color so first i want to use uh red say so now it's in terms of a small change of displacement we have delta u delta v and delta w right three different uh, variables and in the second there are basically three integrals so this integral has this, this three uh, small change of displacement. And in the next integral, we have small change of uh, u, v, w, and something of a rotation. And in this one, third one, we have u, v, w, and another direction rotation. So basically, it's now we, with some mathematics, we find such uh, we interpret it. So a small change of energy in terms of small change of displacement and rotation. So uh, our criterion tells us that this guy should be zero, right? And as I said, that means in equilibrium, a plate, a small change of total energy of a plate should be zero. However, if we write it in this way, it will be much more physically clear for us. So we write it this way means at equilibrium in e equilibrium any small change of 
your displacement or rotation rotation should not change the total energy mm -hmm. I think this statement is much more uh, physically uh, reasonable for us to understand. So that means if the material, if the, the plate is in equilibrium, if you change a little bit about introduce a small, let's say, perturbation or small change of displacement, the total energy should not be changed. So this is the, the physics behind it. That means, what, but in terms of mathematics, that means whenever, I mean, you have an arbitrary, for arbitrary set of du, dv, dw, dw, comma x, dw, comma y. So this is arbitrary set of these uh, five parameters or variables. You always have, we always have total energy change equals zero. So this is the physics and the mathematics behind this, this expression, this criteria. So the very important word is this set is arbitrary. For example, we can say, say we can choose a set of like, I want to say this one zero, other things, oh, this one equals one and others is zero, or two, others zero, zero, or this one zero, others two, one. So for any of this, this guy should be zero. That means there are actually there are three integrals, right? So because for arbitrary this set, we always have zero. So I have to say the first part is zero. And for the first integral, I mean dx dy have to be zero. It's always zero. And the second integral dy should always be zero. Okay, and the last term. The integral of dx is also zero. Moreover, this is not enough. Moreover, we have, because this is arbitrary, this is arbitrary, arbitrary. So we have, have to, because, right, you can change whatever you want. So the coefficient, right, should be zero. Otherwise, you cannot satisfy. And this coefficient is quite long. This guy is also always zero. And same thing applies to your second. Uh, uh, integrals, right? So let's look at them one by one. So for the first one, let's say the first integral has to be zero, always zero. As I said, you have three variables and the coefficient of these three zeros, uh, the three variables have to be zero forever, always zero, zero, and last guy, zero. So what does this mean? Let's write let us write it down. So the first guy, first coefficient equals zero, x x prime uh, uh, comma x plus then x y comma y have to be zero. Um, as I said, it's comma, right? You can also write it other way. D n x x d x d y equals zero, right? If you are sensitive about four four one comma equation. This guy is nothing but the in plane four four one comma equation. Comma equation in x direction. Okay. So what is the second one? The second one is an xy. I will also write it down. So something becomes more familiar when we write it this way. D n y y d y equals zero. And this is nothing but in plane in y direction, right? And what is the last one? So before going to the last one, I think we should have to look at this guy. So because this one is always zero, so we neglect this one, right? This is zero from the in plane. I know this is zero and this is zero, right? So what, re what is remaining is this guy equals zero, right? It's always zero. So what is this guy? 
10 x x i will directly write it this way 2 n x y d square w d x dy plus n y y d square w d y square and plus from x x x x comma x x plus 2 n x y plus x y uh, comma x y m y y comma y y this guy is always zero and if you're familiar with i mean for the quantum equation this is nothing but the outer plane outer plane have a big k equation right or you can say it's in z direction yeah so yeah probably it's for it's good for me to write it down here so m x x it's nothing but here, kappa xx plus u kappa yy, right? And kappa, you can write further, write it down. Uh, to minus, right? Remember, there is a minus d squared w dx squared, right? So if you plug in plug everything into it, in this term, in parentheses, is nothing but d nabla 4w, right? I mean, there is a minus. So, in this way, I think let's well, by looking at the first integral, we already get our what we want, which is uh, the Popov von Kami equations, right? The three Popov von Kami equations are here. Kind of the first task is done, right? It's done. Then, how about the other two integrals? Right? We still have to look at this, what, what is behind this two integrals always equal zero. So this is second one and this third. I will tell you this is the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions? Boundary conditions. So uh, why it is boundary condition? Let me let me just give you one example. So n x x delta u at x equals zero, x equals zero. So this guy just the notation is this way, but we can write it in here. D u at x equals L minus n x x du at x equals zero. So as that, your choose your, your choice about this delta u and delta v are really arbitrary, right? Are really arbitrary. And what I want to show, I mean, that you know is we have such a plate. This is as x equals zero, and this is at x equals L. So these two boundaries are a kind of the variations of, I mean, a small change of this uh, at these two boundaries are independent, right? They are independent. So I have to, because the integral is always zero, I have to set this guy always at equal zero and this guy also at, at, at equal zero. That means at x equals L, At x equals L, you because this guy is zero, we either have x x equals zero, or we have delta u at, at uh, be zero, right? And also the same thing applies to your left edge. So also or delta u equals zero. So if you are familiar with the boundary conditions, you look at this. This is nothing but a static boundary condition, right? You define the boundary condition uh, with uh, imposed force or uh, stress, right? And this is kinetic, kinematic boundary condition. You give a, a, a displacement or like a velocity, right? So this is the, the physics behind these equations. So I did basically for the first term, we can do all this 16 or oh, these eight terms and uh, each of them give you two boundary conditions okay so i list these boundary conditions here so basically on the left side this is at x equals zero or and at x equals l so basically i mean these are the left and the right edges and this two uh, this side is the bottom and top edges. 
So you fully define this. Just to give you one example, if you have a simply supported, for example, if, if you have simply supported a uh, condition on this left, a, uh, left edge, for example, simply supported give you that u, that, that u equals zero, that b equals zero, that w equals zero, and m x x equals zero, right? So this is simply supported. And if you have a fully like clamped du equals zero, dv equals zero, dw equals zero, and dw dot uh, comma x equals zero, right? So this means for a boundary, you choose one of them. Like I choose this guy and become clamped. I choose these three plus this guy, you get simply supported. So for each of the bound, uh, boundaries, we have four boundary, four edges, four edges for our uh, plate, right? For our plate, and we have each of them. We have four boundary conditions. Then it leads to sixteen boundary conditions. So this is what what the second integral and the third integral <laughs> means to us. So I know it's a little bit difficult to follow. Anyway, but then the, uh, I want the, the, the conclusion be delivered. So there are 16 boundary conditions to fully define your plate, okay? The re rectangular plate, okay? So, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I also want, want to leave, leave an exercise for you. This guy probably is not that straightforward, but you can for like to do an exercise. This guy actually is a shear kind of a shear force. Yeah, so you can go back to have a look. I think it covered in one of your lectures. Something like this is your shear force in one of the other directions. For example, you know that this is an xy, right? And this is ny and nxx. And in this direction, actually, in z direction, you have this guy. So if you are interested in, you can go back into your laptop and find if you can find something uh, about this, okay? So with this, I want to like give a brief summary of part one. So you may find it, uh, it's a lot of equations and probably it's a little bit difficult to follow and it involves a lot of math. However, I want to give you the purpose of the, the first part is I want to give you a take home message. It's okay that you forget all, all about everything else, but this take home message is quite important to fully determine the deflection of a rectangular elastic plate. We need, how much we need? We need three governing equations. Right? There are the four pole von Kármán equations. And what else we need? We need 16 boundary conditions. Right? This is very important. Actually, I have to say, unfortunately, a lot of researchers just miss this. They don't know how to there are actually 16 boundary conditions. This is extremely important. Actually, I want to say, if in the future you want to do some research about plate buckling, and uh, for example, do some numerical simulations, don't forget there is 16 boundary conditions for you. And missing one of them probably will lead to a unsolvable problem, okay? So also I can give you an answer. There is a question. Let me finish this. There is an exercise for you if you can Go back and look at cylindrical coordinate or spherical coordinate. Probably you can also derive what is the boundary condition for those sorts to coordinate. This probably can be a good access for you if you want to follow the lecture notes. Okay, there is a question. So let me see how to how to do it. Yeah, how to open like a question. Oh, right. Um, okay, yeah. Is it okay to ask a question before you move to the next part? Yeah, no problem. Uh, 
So when we are writing like the functional, why are we only considering the strain energy and not like the work done as well? Are we considering that's not loading on the plate? Shouldn't we be minimizing the potential and not the strain energy? Uh, you want to optimize the, sorry, it's a little bit hard for, to hear it clearly, clearly. So you want to study the small change of force so like the potential would be the elastic, the U minus the W, right? So what yes. happened to the W terms? Uh, you mean here? Uh, which side? I think it's the about the work done by the external forces. You have not assumed anything about an external loading on this case. Ah, yeah, yeah. I didn't put uh, external loading. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have external loading, right, you have here something here, here, right? Yeah. Right, so you have a P, right? Something, right? Yeah, you can you can include it into a virtual work. Right, then you can get a potential energy. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Okay, so I will go for go go with the next step. So briefly summarize the part one, and the second point I want to show you is what is the advantage of such an energy method. Clearly, if you, if we can write, write every component of energy, right? Or the energy terms, terms, or the components. Energy method, basically, is very convenient, right? If you can write it. Yeah, this is one of the advantage. And if you can do energy method, it will provide you a complete description of the governing equation and also the boundary condition, right? If you do a, such a study, it's very unlikely that you will miss one of them, right? Three and 16, you all, you all have all of them. So this is the benefit of doing an energy method. Okay, so with this, we can, I think we can go to the next thing. Next part is, I will give you an example in our everyday life. I hope it will be a very interesting uh, example, right? So the example is the wrinkling. So there are different kinds of wrinkles in our nature. Uh, in nature and in also engineering uh, cases. So I will first show you some cases and then I want to systematically provide you a historic overview of how people, how researchers, those smart guys are attempting to solve the performance kind of equations for characterization of wrinkles. Okay, so first of all, what is the wrinkles? So this is a Wikipedia definition. Wrinkles, they said it's folds, rage, and uh, creases of thin films, as, such as skins and fabrics. So there is very, I mean, very, very interesting difference between these three things. It's very hard for me to recognize what is a fold, what is a ridge, what is crease. However, if you look at like geology things, folks, you will find that they, they fully defined how, what is this guys. Okay, so there are a lot of, bunch of uh, wrinkles in nature. Yeah, so this guy, we can have some a look. So this guy, you may guess what is it is. So it is actually an apple. If you cut an apple and after drying, it will, you will have some wrinkles. And this is for sure, is someone's skin, right? Someone's skin. And if you compress it, there will be some wrinkles. And this is a little bit hard to, to guess. This is actually a human body cell. And this is the membrane of a human body cell. Something goes into a cell, May cause, may cause the wrinkle in these are thin cells. And also, there are, we have a lot of plants, right? Plants, plants have this kind of wrinkles, so when they grow, and this is a leaf, this is a flower we have here, and this is a red cabbage, and here there are other wrinkles. So all these wrinkles are very interesting. That's definitely, they involve different kinds of stability problems. So this kind of, these three cases, they have substrate, substrate, right? Here, for example, there is 
apple and you have some tissues. So this uh, inside the cell there is something. So all of these have subst substrate. And these three, they don't have substrate. And they basically have in-plane loadings to cause uh, a wrinkle. So today I'm just want to cover one of the uh, one type of wrinkles. This is called uh, change point. This is called a stretch induced wrinkling. So basically, this is a plate. If you the, the physics process about it is you, for example, you use your hand to hold these two uh, edges and then apply a displacement, a stretch. Then, if it is a like a good plastic plate, you will get wrinkles in this direction. So this is a special phenomenon that I want to show you how to study this using a focal von Kármán equation. So actually, the governing equation is a focal von Kármán equation. The three equations. Okay. So first of all, let me let me tell you tell you to discuss more about physics process. So as I said, uh, here the dash line is a reference configuration, right? It's a, you, something you get. And then you apply simply supported boundary condition, simply supported boundary condition, and the two, uh, yeah, I want to say this is left, right, and the left con edges. You apply simply supported, so holding means, right? That held, that is held, that means simply supported. And you also stretch it, right? That means you impose displacement. And let's say this displacement is delta. Delta is equals L, uh, epsilon equals L. So this is a nominal, nominal strain. So nominal strain, how much stretch you apply, right? And the physics behind it is you have bottom and top. They are free, free boundaries, okay? So um, I also want to, first of all, give you a quantitative, uh, qualitatively, uh, interpretation, interpretation of uh, why wrinkles happen. So basically, you applied a stretch, right? And stretch. Then, due to Poisson effect, so you will have some shrink because you have Poisson effect, right? You have to go into the y direction. And it causes a compressive, compressive membrane force, right? This compressive membrane force will force you to deform, right? And then, because we have a thin film, right, it's always easier, cheaper to bend rather than membrane deformation. Right. So this is a very easy understanding of it. So it's always, if you compress it, it's always easy for you to bend it rather than to let it um, go into the material, right? Okay, so this is a quite, uh, quite qualitatively uh, understanding. Okay, so as I said, the governing equation, of, of course, is the focal von Kármán equations, right? So there are strategies of solving these focal von Kármán equations with the boundary conditions for the wrinkle or wrinkle problem. However, I have to have to say that it's really a disappointing that there are some 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 descriptions about solving these FDK equations. Whereas the Wikipedia says it's notoriously difficult to solve. Actually, I learned this word here. This is the first time I, I saw this, this word. And more disappointing, I mean, this is not the worst. More disappointing is like two famous researchers in this area. They published a paper in uh, PIO, Physics, uh, Physical Review Letters. They said, essentially, FVK equation is essentially impossible to be solved in analytical solved forms, right? You can also solve it in some certain cases which are one dimensional. <laughs> yeah, this is very disappointing. However, you can do computations, numerical simulations. All you can do, there is a way say, semi-analytical approach, uh, approach. So, to do some semi-analytical approach, you have to do scaling and also some kinds of simplifications. You may, you may make some assumptions. So in today's lecture, I will particularly uh, cover the semi-analytical.
solutions. Okay, so this is the last one, the last sentence from me. I said, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll show you. So to drive a semi-analytical solution, you have to do simplification. And the challenge is how to avoid oversimplifying the, the system or the, the, the equations. Okay, first of all, let me, uh, the, the first model that I want to show you is something that we are very familiar with. There is a kind of some, some early attempts to solve the problem using a classical model. So here are two papers. I, I think of quite good papers for you to follow if you want to use this kind of classical model. So what is a classical model? So this is a classical model that I mean here that, that the refer, uh, researchers used. Uh, I think you should be very familiar with this guy, right? You uh, studied this, I think we solved it. Solved it in, in lecture 10. We have all the, the solutions, right? Except at that time, NXX is a compressive one. Now we change the sign. It's like from negative turn to positive. So this is the, 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 the model that many people use it for, for modeling. So I want to say, it, from this model to this model, you have to do a lot of simplifications. Simplifications, right? So let's count how many simplifications will we need. So the first one is, I will assume, so uh, our, the first uh, assumption is you have to say nxx and nyy in the plate. In the plate is quite uniform. especially at the boundary condition. And also after this kind of definition, any point in the plate, you have these two uniform components, nxx, sorry, nxx and nyy. So everywhere it's equal to your boundary condition. So this is the first simplification with that we did. And the second one is, I will say, because we explained, right, xx, x, uh, nxx is always larger than zero. So this way means you have a tensile in the x direction and you have an NYY negative. This is a compressive, right? The reason is we have Poisson three effect. This is a quite good reasonable assumption, okay? And the third one is, this is a, I think it's a not that good assumption people assume that there is a linear relation between these two components. And of course, this is greater than zero, it's a positive. I have to say this is very strong, very strong assumption, simplification. So, and this is the essential part of this theory, okay? And the last one, we sh people assume that there is no shearing. So basically there are four kinds of, four simplifications, and then you can get, you can, simplify your model from here to here, okay? Also, I want, still I want to comment on these simplifications. The first one I think that I said is super strong, too strong, very strong uh, simplifications. They totally changed your work. Standard conditions, right? So, so you, if you remember for the two left and right corners, you have simply supported R and L. You previously, you have simply supported plus displacement. Now it's changed to simply supported plus force. And bottom and top, previously if you have three, now it's SS plus force again. Right? So that's totally changed your bonding condition. I have to say it's totally different uh, problem, right? The second one is after these simplifications, the in-plane FBK equation. becomes automatically satisfied. That means we don't need to worry about the in plane uh, condition anymore, right? We just go, go, go a step further to the outer plane FBK equation, okay? And now this outer plane equation, we can simplify it, right? So n x y equals zero, and n y y goes to minus c n x x, then your Top of one equation becomes d nabla four w minus n x x d squared w d x squared minus c. I have to put a parenthesis here. 
dw square dy square, right? And most importantly, this equation is solvable. In the class, we already derived it, right? We get uh, assumed a, a general solution of W, right? And uh, sinusoid sorry, to the amplitude. Sinusoid M pi x L sine N pi x uh, W, right? So number of half waves in length and number of half waves in weights, right? And finally, you can get a so-called critical uh, membrane force that applied in this, uh, at the boundary of this uh, plate, right? So it's something like this, m four beta four plus two m square, m square beta square plus uh, n four, yeah, I noticed there is a question. Let me finish this part. Okay, what is the question? Oh yeah, um, yeah. could you clarify why the mm -hmm. in-plane equation is automatically satisfied? Like doesn't the yeah. formal one Karman equation have some coupling terms to the W and the RHS? Yeah, so if you look at this guy, for example, just one, Right, so now we assumed this guy zero, right? And NXX not, not depends on, NX is quite constant. So it's not depends on X and then it becomes zero, right? So you see the X direction is automatically satisfied. Right? Isn't this the linear theory? I thought like the mm -hmm. purple one Karmachian equation had some terms depending on W and the RHS. Yeah, but yeah, I, I think you mean the string, right? String, it depends on have some W, right? Have some W term, right? Yes. Yeah, but here we, after some simplification, we have already assumed this guy is quite constant. So we get one step further, you know? We assumed this is like, this guy, this, this researchers assume that this, this, string, uh, this memory force is everywhere, it's, it's uniform and it is equal to the boundary conditions. Is that clear? So, okay. yeah, it's not depend on X, right? So it's zero. So yeah, in this way, we get this answer, right? And then we find that M, it's a mono monotonic increasing equation. So M, if we want to minimize it, M have to be one. So that means in, in which direction, I mean, here I have got to dip uh, define beta is the aspect ratio. Okay, that means in which direction there is only one half wave. This, I have to say, agrees quite well with the experiment right? in the oh, sorry, in x direction. Length, longitude, no. There is always one, uh, yeah, one, one, one. And the, the, this, this, this guy is only a function of beta n and c. So people can, can just make a plot like this, like what you did in lecture 10. Say, if you have a aspect ratio, and this is just beta, and you can find it, and how many waves, like this is, I think is six or seven, and then you go to this one and find the, the critical xx. So this is how the plot is used, right? However, uh, yeah. Uh, first, I have to acknowledge the contribution of this classic model. So it explains quite well uh, physics. The physics is quite reasonable, right? It exp at least it explains why there is m equals one, right? In one in this direction, there is only one wave, and in this direction, there are several waves. So this is its contribution. However, there are some several problems. The first problem I want to say is C is always unknown. Is that unknown? So how to make this plot? We have already assumed this is, uh, I have to tell you, this is 0.01 <laughs> to make this plot. And in real research, if you want to get it, you have to do numerical simulations. There is no way to measure it anywhere, okay? Yeah. 
of course, you can measure it. However, it's not that accurate because it's, it's not constant. <laughs> yeah, you can do simulations and then find it. This is how people are researchers are doing it. And the most problem, the biggest problem is I draw even bigger <laughs> dot here, the prediction of an XX critical is not good, is not accurate. Okay. To my experience, the error can be even larger than 100%, even like 10 times is possible in some cases. So this is totally not acceptable. So I have to say, this is oversimplification. Okay, so let me go to, based on this understanding, we go to another second model that people are using uh, to develop to, to, to model these kind of wrinkles. So there are also two papers, uh, two papers from famous professor uh, at, at MIT, uh, uh, sorry, at Harvard. <laughs> Why is this? Okay, Professor Mahadevan group, they developed two, it's also quite early, and one of them is published in Nature, and one of them is published in PIO. Okay, and we now know that this is the, the most biggest problem of the classical understanding, right, the classical problem. So how people, how Professor Mahadevan solved the problem is they developed a so-called inextensibility constraint. This is the expression for their constraint. So they said, if you want to deform to develop wrinkles, you have to satisfy this constraint. So how to understand this constraint is my task. So what is the physics behind this constraint? If I have a look at this term here, yeah, I also put a plate here. So if you look at this guy, this actually is nothing but epsilon y y, right? Epsilon y y is what is this definition? It's dv dy plus dy squared, right? And because of Poisson's ratio, this guy is nothing but this thing, right? If you, and minus, if you plug back into it, it means you integral from you over the width of your y string, that should be zero. So what is the physics behind it? So first of all, this is epsilon y y, so I'm letting you know. The second thing is integral dy goes to, sorry, this one should be zero. What does this mean? That means your weight, the weight of the plate is not changed before and after when clean. That's a very, very interesting constraint. And more importantly, it looks like physically reasonable. Right? If you look at this plate, the width of, if you integral over it, it looks like width is not changed. Right? So this is what they mean by inextensibility. That means the width is not extensible, okay? And then how to make use of this, this so-called constraint? So th this is another very smart uh, equation. You look at, they created a so-called potential energy to make use of it, to incorporate the constraint into the total energy, the energy method. Right. So this will be your total uh, potential energy. And we're familiar with this guy, right? This is the total string energy that we derived. And here, this is our constraint. I will use in extensibility constraint. And why there is such a term? And what is the physics? This is my task to explain. Right? If you look at, first of all, this guy, I have to say this is unknown. But it has a measurement of string. 
in this way, in this way, E H a strain is nothing but a measure of force. Right? It's a measure of force. Then you can understand it as NYY, an artificial NYY. Okay? This is the, uh, the creative thing of their model. And then the second term, the whole second term, EH dy becomes a work, right? It has a measure, a measure of work or energy, right? So what does the total energy, potential energy means? Then if you, like, if the inextensibility constraint is satisfied, you get equals to string energy, what we have already had, right? If not, if it's violated, if not, this kind of compressive compression will do some work. Let's say it's a virtual work. Do work and reduce. Reduce your total energy as a penalty. Right? This is a very straightforward understanding for you. For example, if it's violated, it's non-zero, or it's po it's if it's positive, or let's just say it's positive, then your compressive will do work. If it's this is extend is like increased, then if the the width is increased, it will do work. If it's uh, compressed, uh, sorry, probably if it's in increased, it will reduce your energy, and if it is decreased, it will increase your energy, right? So this is uh, the, the logic behind this uh, potential energy. And with this potential energy, of course, they, they do many more simplifications about the energy term. The, the other, uh, I will probably go much faster than this. So they also did some, some simplifications. Say, these guys are negligible. Why? Because alpha beta is minus d w squared d alpha d beta, right? So if you look at this guy over the ratio between these guys, x, y, you have m squared, n squared, m, n. So assuming there is a sinusoid function. So this one, from our experimental observations, this one is always one. So and there are a couple of like seven to 10 wrinkles, let's say seven to 10 wrinkles. So always this guy is the biggest one and it's even cubic, right? It's even square, right? So it should be four if we look at the energy term. Yeah, so this one, negligible, negligible, negligible. So only thing you have is this guy. This is a quite reasonable understanding, right? And the membrane energy, say that we shear, we, we ignore shear. No shear. And if we look at this guy, I have already said that NYY is already included. In the cons in extensibility constraint, right? So I take it out. It's not because it's zero. It's not zero, but it's already included elsewhere, right? So we can only write it here, okay? So the total energy, potential energy can be written in this way. It's much easier for us and uh, I mean, it's much easier mathematically to derive uh, Euler, uh, its corresponding Euler uh, Langrange equation or the Popov von Kármán equations. Then what it will be like, then I will write this down, probably as our so D4, DY4 minus EH, D squared W, DX squared N EH star Y squared. Right, so this is the simplified Popov von Kármán equation. Okay, again, we already made some estimations. So a 
applied stretch is equal to this, and n y y is equal to this, which is this is really uh, our our uh, the physics behind it. Okay, if we look at the original original uh, for Bobon Kama equation, we can understand how much terms have been how many terms have been neglected. First of all, we neglect this guy because it's trivial, right? This is also trivial, and we understand it as some external loading, and this guy is zero, and we ha have this guy, EH, right? So now you understand with this, like only three assumptions, right? This is assumption one, you neglect this, this two, and assumption two, no sharing, you ignore, you ignore this guy, and the assumption, uh, assumption three, you get this guy, right? There is a compressive. A compressive, uh, uh, compressive loading, right? So then it will make you easier to to give you this equation. Then, so what I want to put it here is most importantly, it is again solvable. And if you look at the what is the difference between this guy, what is Serdar Mahadevan versus classical? If you look at it. This boundary, this for von Kármán FVK equation is exactly the same, right? They have the same form. It's identical. Why? But then why Sardar Mahadevan is better? This is actually a, a very interesting question. The solution is, I mean, why is Sardar and Mahadevan better? Because, again, Classical model, you have a C, right? It's always unknown and it's hurting you. However, Soda Mahadevan developed a extensibility uh, constraint. Then that one provide serves as a second equation for you to do some estimations. For for example, epsilon and the epsilon star. So then it's just like you have two equations rather than one, right? So in the classical equation, you have only one and you have to do numerical simulations. However, now we have a very physically reasonable constraint for you and then you can put them together and give you a quite good estimation or a good, uh, even uh, analytical solution. So this is uh, so the Mahadevan's analytical solution. It looks like, very, it looks very interesting and uh, actually somehow it's, Quite beautiful, right? This this is uh, wavelengths. So the, the like this between these two waves, lambda, let's say half wavelengths, right? So this is the half wavelengths and the amplitude of each wave or each wrinkle. So this is the experimental result. We can see uh, they are here. I think they are gamma. In our case, it's epsilon. We write it in epsilon. So. Wavelength is only a function of how much strain you applied, right? There is, if you take one over four, uh, it should be a linear equation. I mean, minus, right? There's minus. So it should be a linear equation and they achieved quite good agreement with the experimental data. So that's their contribution and they published the quite good result in PIO and also in nature. So I think, in my opinion, that most of their contribution lies in the in inextensibility constraint, okay? So this is a very interesting topic. If you want, you can read more into their papers, okay? So what is that question? Um, just a quick question. Is that epsilon yeah. star a constant and does it like fit that far or how is it? Yeah, very good question. Actually, they assume that it's constant. So if you, yeah, there is quite complicated estimations. It's already, uh, it's also some smart point how Professor Mahadevan did it. So I would encourage you to read the uh, probably PIO paper. So there is a process how to do this. So in class, I don't want to do, go deeply into this. Okay, yeah. Junior, uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, sure, wait. So between this and the previous model, there is a fundamental discrepancy, which is the, the classical model assumes there's a critical load. Mm -hmm. This one yeah. assumes that uh, amplitude and the strain are, you know, monotonically increasing. There's no sense of like a critical 
It's yes. Great. Yes. Which one is the more consistent with the physics? Um, in my opinion, the later one is quite is more reasonable because I also tried it. I will let you know, I also tried to, to optimize the energy using some numerical word uh, tools. And I found actually this is always increasing with number of n. Oh, I mean, sorry, not this one, the total energy. Total energy is always increasing with, and this is my experience. However, I think there is a one more paper. I will, I will cover one more paper to show you how, how is this possible, okay? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of future further papers who extended Sir Mahadeva solution. The most interesting one, and I think I would highly recommend you to read this paper if you are interested in this one. So Pantos paper, they extended this inextensibility constraint. And their inextensibility constraint is like this. First, they introduced one more term. Oh, sorry, this guy. Remember in Sada Mahadevan, there is only this guy, right? Now we, they said, this is not negligible because we can think about more, right? And we assume it's not a uniform one over length. So now you have to also integral by length. And then it looks like gives you an average shrinking or in a change of uh, average change of width. Width uh, caused by bending. And if you say put a G here, if G like only about goes to mu, and of course if you neglect this, then it reduces to So that might happen, right? So in this way, this uh, this assumption, I have to say, one uh, oh sorry, one is Panto et al. Panto's team, they assume that weight is changeable, right? It's changeable. It's not one hundred percent not changeable. You can change this guy G. And then the second improvement says that the change of width is very in x direction. So then this is much more general. This is much more general. In other words, the assumption is much weaker. And your solution should be much better, right? Your fit or your fitting can, should be much, much better. But if you look at, again, if you look at the, the focal point common equations, basically the same, the only thing different is because you introduced this guy here. So if you do uh, the variation, you still have this guy contributing uh, in d squared w dx uh, x squared. So this is the only difference compared to so the other one. But I still want to recommend you this paper because it provide a step-by-step -step derivation about uh, the, 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 the wavelengths and the critical. And this is to answer William's question. Actually, in their paper, they provided something like this. And it's, uh, if I remember it correctly, it's something like still this uh, pi square, I think it's d, and uh, this is something like this also. And inside this, they have if I remember, it's like this, blah, blah, blah. So clearly it's a monotonically increasing function of n. So this is what we find. And I also tried to derive this and I find it's also monotonically, monotonically uh, increasing function. So this is, I think it's the physics behind it. So it's no way to optimize the uh, energy. Yeah, so we can probably discuss more in uh, after class because I think time is running fast, <laughs> yeah. And I also have to, I want to mention my contribution in this area. So in nature, actually, there is a lot of uh, materials. There is, I have to say, there is no material in nature is purely, perfectly isotropic. Almost every material is kind of anisotropic, uh, anisotropic, right? So if you include, I mean, think about this, extend it, it's anisotropic. For common equation, you introduce like 
the ratio between the two directions, x, y directions, and the shear over x, x uh, against modules, you, have, you can get such an equation. And the interesting point is now you have, before this term you have R, you have Q. So in, for some materials, R can be very small, like 1.01, some, some materials is possible. So this, now you, you can no longer neglect this kind of these things. You have to put everything still be there. And there is no way to neglect anything anymore, as, uh, uh, unless you have some, some, some data, right? So this kind of interesting phenomena in the, I mean, interesting uh, function result in an interesting uh, phenomena. So this is the material that actually, this is me. I study, so the R is really small, like 0.07. That means the two directions can be really different, like six times the difference. So when I do the test, I find that if we stretch it in this way, there is perfectly, there is no uh, wrinkles. So that means it gives you an in-plane solution, W equals zero. And if I stretch it in this way, I get a lot, a lot of wrinkles, but then it's not zero. So that's a, uh, uh, I mean, just a, a study. If you're interested, just uh, read my paper. <laughs> yeah. So this is one interesting phenomenon. And I think it's, it's as the last example that I want to close the uh, second part. And I think I will skip this part uh, summary because I think the time is running so fast. Yeah. And I think for, uh, the contribution is I semi analytical. Conclusions and solutions can be derived. Right. And the second one is we can easily do energy method. And the good thing is another advantage of, of energy method is you can do simplifications on the energy terms that makes you even uh, easier to do simplification. Right? However, I want to take a limitation of of one time equation. What's that? It only applies for elastic material. There is no plasticity and there is no fracture. Later, I will show you some examples how to, where plasticity and the fracture is very important. And also, I think I didn't have time to cover numerical method. I have to mention that there is quite a lot of FEA finite element as method to simulate Popovangama equation, so Popovangama equation. But I also want to take this opportunity to show you something interesting. So my team, our team actually at ICL under Professor Wittwick's lead, Actually, me and my collaborator are using machine learning <laughs> to solve FVK equations. So currently, our results, our code can solve an in-plane solution. If we, for such a plate, we apply a force, we can set the machine learning prediction. We can accurately give you some distributions of force, uh, of stress. Also, auto-plane compression, something like this, we can predict for you the, how much deflection you will have in y direction and their manuscript in preparation. Yeah, if you are interested, be, be, be like, stay informed if I publish a new paper, <laughs> okay? So yeah, we have hardly only several minutes. So let me go to third part and go really quickly to give you many examples how people, I think they are more interesting, more useful in engineering, how people are solving Wrinkling problem or plate problems, plate packing problems. Okay, the first, uh, I will go first. And the first examples comes from shipbuilding and automotive. So there is a very important topic on structure failure of metal plates. The first example is, there's a very interesting one called Constantina tearing. That's studied by my advisor, Professor Thomas Wisbicki. Yeah, so basically when a ship is subject to grounding, it's something like a stone can initiate a crack and then apply a load and this then just kind of tearing your the bottom the bottom of the shape right so at that time professor wiki with wiki don't have like uh, a very good computer right so he he's really doing origami origami 
Yeah, these are basically paper models. He developed some very good paper models. And in this way, he identified, for example, in this range, there is bending. In this range, there is membrane stretching. And in this range, there is shearing. And here at the edge, there is fracture. Okay. In this way, uh, of course, I have to say he considered about plasticity. This is a very common plastic hinge. Yeah, if you're interested, you can read his uh, lecture notes in structural mechanics. I think it's the last lecture note on plasticity. And he derived, he did the same thing like ours to energy method. And this is the virtual power and the virtual energy rate. And then you can, this is the force that he got. And I want to let you know that the very, very interesting part is he got this B. B is the width of a crack. And X is how much you pushed. And B0 is the initial uh, width. Then it looks like there is no material parameter in this equation, right? That means the geometry is quite uh, independent of material property. So if you do a steel, if you do aluminum, this should be the same. And as long as the thickness is quite close, you can even do it with paper. So there is a movie from me. This guy is my head. There are my hands. This is me. So you can do a very interesting, small experimental with your knife and paper. First, you put a pre-crank into, into this paper and use a pen. Make a crack here. Use a pen to push it quickly. Right? And you take it out, you will see concertina tear. Compared to plastic, to steels, it's really, I mean, similar. Yeah, this is a very interesting experiment. For example, you, you can try to reproduce it. It's quite uh, easily. And I want to say is this geometry and this, this geometry has only a difference because of their thickness difference. Okay. And the second example that I want to give you is the so-called shear buckling of a plate. And it's also representing the damage pattern of a plate hull uh, inflicted by grounding, right? So grounding may take, it, take a material in this way, and you have good uh, clamping on these two sides. And in this way, it will give you a lot of buckling in this way. It's like a, it's like a, a lot of dimples, yeah? Also, I, I want to tell you that you can also use the Popov-Hohenheim equation if it's elastic. However, in this, class, in this way, I think it's clear that plasticity plays a way, plays a role. Yeah, so this is another interesting loading. And we have to look at, we didn't cover, I think, in this lecture, the effect of boundary conditions, right? Different boundary conditions will give you totally different response, okay? The third example is so-called progressive fold, uh, folding of a rectangular column. Yeah, this is another thing that if you look at the side of the column, it's like this, and this is the one, uh, a lot of plat plastic hinges. And then finally you will get it. And I, I was there when William gave you the, the, the lecture on elasticity and uh, he showed you some NASA Product, and that one is plastic. If you pr push it more and more into a plastic range, very nice foldings will come out like this. And this is again the origami model that Professor Wisbicki did for this kind of model. And you see here, plastic hinge, plastic hinge. So this is very nice. And if you write all, all the energies down and you can derive the force, usually the force is like this. F and this is the displacement, say D. Usually you have a peak and you have several waves. This is usually one wave. And on this, this curve, this is the energy. The advantage of this guys of the structure is it can absorb a lot of energies. So that's why it is used as uh, energy absorbers, crush boxes. Yeah, this is another work of myself and I did it in during my past, uh, master degree. And this is a uh, uh, energy absorber and uh, 
people, yeah, probably I have a question for you. So do you know what is this guys? Actually, it's their imperfections introduced in these columns. So basically, it's like such a column. People will make it not a perfect like a uh, column. It make you some pre damage here, so that it will induce a quite good buckling. And I also did at that time. I did a like crash test. Yeah, crash test. This is the car. This is a rigid wall. It's it's really high speed test and. Uh, the car hit you here and look at this. Finally, at this stage, the crush box is already almost cr uh, crushed and the bumper is really still there, right? So this is a, it's a real design actually. It's a real design of a car. Yeah, I also did simulations for it. It's quite, if your material model is quite good, you can also get a quite good force, okay? And then uh, there are two more examples. I, I, I will just give you Roughly give you an idea, and uh, I want to say first is in human body there is a lot of thin films. There is really interesting ultra thin, ultra thin films. One example is retina behind your eye eyeball, and the, the problem is for this kind of material is uh, this photo actually a group this group actually these authors are studying a biomaterial to mimic your retina. So in these cases the challenge is that this kind of solid is always in Emerge in like uh, immerse like in your in your uh, in some liquid. So if you consider about the dynamic process, you always have an initial term. And behind on the left right side, this is nothing but a popo comic vision. However, now you have the initial term, right? Okay. And the last, I want to use this example to close my lecture. So this is the COVID nineteen or SARS. Yeah, I think we should use a better name, SARS, COP2, <laughs> uh, virus. And for those viruses, is there, is, there is usually so-called shell. And many people do studies on these shells. However, it is really questionable. Is this shell a liquid or a solid? It's really questionable. However, many people have done that. Many people put the virus under an atomic force microscope and do such a, this is a cantilever beam, and do such a compression of a virus. And then they can study the mechanical uh, response. Very interesting. Many people, many studies say the response highly depends on something called focal von Kármán number. And this is, uh, right, I define this. This is the stretching stiffness and this is the bending stiffness. And with different, for a common number, you can have different uh, responses. And if you like uh, have small, I think have a very large for a common number, or that means your thick, thickness is very large, then uh, very, very small, sorry. Then you will very probably have some buckles. Okay, so this is the, the example that I want to use for to close my lecture and uh, I hope everyone uh, have good uh, good luck with your question and also most importantly stay safe.